Welcome back friends, my name is Brian and I am back in the garage once again. Today I got a video for you that is very practical, but one thing that's fantastic about it is that if you want to avoid using profanity, this is the video for you. Pre-assembly inspection of your motor components is important before you put the parts back together in your engine. All right, so a couple special things I want to mention up front. One is that this can be a little bit dull. I'm sorry about that. Some of these things is measure, inspect, measure, inspect. So. I know it's a little bit dull, but in the interest of trying to help you with the boredom, I uh, added timestamps into the description box so you can move around. If you want to move to a different procedure, one specifically that you're looking for, look in the timestamps. You'll be able to jump around and avoid you know, the same repetitive stuff that you're going to end up seeing. Another thing, this video is not exhaustive. I've covered 99% of the things that you're going to need in order to make sure that your motor is not warped or worn out or whatever. but. It's not exhaustive. There's a lot of inspections that need to be done on a motor. In the interest of that, I have included a link in the description box to the service manual. So some of the procedures like inspecting the oil pump, a couple of other ones that are also a little less important to me, but nonetheless need to be done. I'm just leaving those to you guys to look up in the service manual, but I've got that for you in the description box. Now, that said, there are a couple of important considerations. Now, I try to make my videos appeal to those home shop people who don't have a whole machine shop at their disposal, but still want to get these things done. Now, you're still going to have to have a certain number of precision tools in order to do this job. Most of them are not super expensive, but you're going to need a dial caliper like this one. Uh, this is just a precision tool for making measurements, and pretty much most home shop users are going to have something like this. You're also going to need these special telescoping gauge set. Now these are pretty inexpensive and these are used for measuring the inside diameter of all kinds of things, mostly the cylinder. Also you're going to need a set of feeler gauges and these are like precision tools that are used to measure gaps. So you're going to need a set of feeler gauges. And finally, this little metal ruler. You don't have to have this, but I really recommend it because um, it is something that you can use to graduate distances, and to me that's very, very helpful. All these things I have links for in my description box, so there's purchasing links. If it's something that you want to pick these things up, you are going to need them. Now, a couple other things. So this video is KLX 110 specific. So this was done in a Kawasaki KLX 110. However, these processes apply to virtually every motorcycle. So if you have a different type of motorcycle, don't fret. You can always use these same procedures on those. You're just going to need a service manual specific to your individual bike. One other thing I want to mention, I am going to use some engineering terms in this video. One that I'm going to say frequently that if you've not heard it before, you need to hear this and this is something you need to commit to memory, ID and OD. ID is inside diameter and OD is outside diameter. So again, I try to tailor my videos to home shop people and not everybody's heard those terms. So I just want to give you those preemptively just so you have it. Now I mentioned this stuff is a little bit tedious, it is, but I promise you, if you take the time to do a little bit of inspection before you build your motor, you're going to be a lot happier. It's so frustrating to go through all these processes and find out something like, you know, your transmission won't shift and you got to take the whole engine back apart. Well worth the time to invest at the beginning to check all these things over, even if it's a little bit tedious and a little bit boring. So that is all I have to say about that. Now it's time to start working on our cylinder. So let's go to the cylinder. Cylinders are measured in opposing directions at different heights to determine the cylinder's overall roundness along the entire bore. Checks are made fore and aft on what's called the y-axis and on the lateral side, which is called the x-axis. The first two depth measurements are indexed from the top of the cylinder, with the first being taken at a depth of 10 millimeters. Then the second one's done at 60 millimeters. The third measurement is indexed from the bottom of the cylinder at 20 millimeters. The range of variability in a standard cylinder is between 52.997 millimeters and 53.009, with out of service limit being at 53.1. Start by setting a depth of 10 millimeters on the scale gauge ruler. Drop it into the bore and release the spring loaded indexing rods. Using the scale gauge ruler, confirm the depth. Tighten the set screw and set the measurement. Then roll the tool out of the bore and confirm the inside diameter or ID with the caliper. 
So for this first measurement, the value is 52.98 millimeters, which is just slightly smaller than the factory quoted minimum of 29.997. Now I've seen this undervalue before and it's never been a problem. My advice is just don't worry about it if it's a very small deviation from minimum like this. Repeat the same process on the x-axis. Next, set the scale gauge ruler for the next step of 60 millimeters. And using the same procedure, measure the y and x-axis. In this case, the y value is 52.90 millimeters. And the x is 52.97. Next, turn the cylinder over and set the depth to 20 millimeters and repeat the process. Here my x-axis reading is 53.04, which is close to the service limit. And the x, which comes in at 52.89 millimeters. All right, so while the values are in spec, next we're going to go on to the piston. Now the KLX uses what's called a three-groove piston. Some four-strokes use a two-groove piston, and if that's something you need a little more detail on, I did a very comprehensive video on everything about piston rings, two-groove, three-groove, and you can find the link to that up here. So if that's something that you need, there you go. All right, so that's it for now. We're going to come back and work on this piston after a short break. I'm going to show you everything you need to know about a piston, so be right back. All right, so let's go over what comprises a three groove piston. I'm gonna show you that now, working my way from the top down. The topmost ring in the ring stack is called the compression ring, which I have marked here with a little yellow paint. The next one down is the scraper ring, and that one I've marked in white. The oil control ring is actually comprised of three rings. This one marked in blue, and a little hard to see here is the second one in red. Sandwiched between these are this wavy ring in the bottom most piston groove. All right, so now let's go over how to check the piston ring end gap. Starting with the compression ring, squeeze it and slide it into the bottom of the cylinder using a piston to square the ring into the bore at around 10 to 20 millimeters from the bottom. All right, when you're measuring end gap, you're actually taking two measurements. So if you're using a new set of rings, you wanna make sure that those rings fall into the specification rec recommended by the manufacturer. Now, if you have a cylinder that's in spec, I have personally never found end gap to fall outside of that range. So frankly, I just quit checking them. But if you are using used rings, and maybe your cylinder has been re-nickel re plated or something like that, you're gonna to wanna to check this end gap. And by the way, the service limit for the end gap is between, or sorry, the range for the standard is between 0.15 and 0.3 millimeters. The service limit for the compression ring is 0.6 millimeters. So with the ring inserted and the ring squared, select the feeler gauge blade closest to 0.6 millimeters. So this feeler basically acts as a no-go gauge. In other words, if it won't slide into the ring gap, you know the service limit has not been exceeded. The procedure is the same for the second ring with the exception of the service limit, which for this ring is 0.8 millimeters. And finally, check the two oil rings using the same procedure. For these rings, the service limit is 0.9 millimeters. Now, if for some reason your end gap is under specification, like you have re-nickel sealed your bore, something like that, uh, if you need to uh, increase the gap, the way that you do this is you take the ring and support it on something flat and firm and file into that gap vertically. Make sure that you're at a 90 degree angle to the face of that opening and also support that ring like I mentioned firmly. Rings are surprisingly brittle and you don't want them bending or anything like that. So just make sure that you support most of the ring and only work through that little channel that you're trying to file down. Personally, I have maybe filed in my life two rings, something like that. So it seems like they're always in spec. All right, so with that, we're gonna move on to the final procedure on the piston, and that is ring thickness. And on the KLX, the only rings that have a spec for ring thickness are the compression ring and the scraper ring. 
In this case, the spec for the compression ring and the scraper ring is 0.7 millimeters. Since both top rings have the same service limit, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna show you how to measure one. With your caliper, check the thickness near the gap and also near the back. All right, in this case, both values were 0.72 millimeters, which is well within the 0.70 service limit. That is all for the rings. When we come back, we're gonna go over the piston. So hang out, we'll be right back. All right, so on to the piston. Now the piston inspection includes checking the groove width, basically, the skirt outside diameter, the bore where the wrist pin goes through inside diameter, and the wrist pin itself outside diameter. So let's start with the grooves. The service limit on the top and second ring groove is 0.9 millimeters. Now the closest feeler that I have to that is a 0.889. So just as we use the service limit feeler as a no-go gauge on the ring end gap in the cylinder, here we know that if the piston groove is within the limit, the feeler won't slide into the groove. So measure both grooves at a few locations to ensure that the no-go gauge won't pass. Now obviously if the feeler gauge falls into one of those grooves, it's outside of spec and you're going to have to replace the piston. Alright, so next we're going to look at the skirt and this is a really interesting thing. So the measurement for the outside diameter of the piston skirt has to be taken at a very precise 7.8 millimeters from the bottom of the piston. For this procedure, again, use the adjustable scale gauge metal ruler and set that to 7.8 millimeters. Mark the indexing point Then, with your caliper, check the outside diameter. By rotating the piston just a bit, you can ensure that the jaws of the caliper are square with the skirt. The service limit OD for this piston skirt is 52.83 millimeters, and this one measures at 52.94, so it's fine. The next piston check is for the piston ring pin bore ID. Insert the telescoping bore gauge into the wrist pin bore just as you did when you were measuring the ID of the cylinder. The service limit on the piston bore is 13.07 millimeters, so at 12.84, this one is well within spec. All right, so the final inspection is the wrist pin, and the way that you inspect the wrist pin is to take measurements and get those values along several points along the entire length of the wrist pin. As I mentioned, while you measure, rotate the pin to find the high and the low points. The center of the pin where it passes through the little end of the rod tends to get the most wear. The service limit for the wrist pin is 12.96 millimeters, so as you can see, this one is bumping right up against the service limit and needs to be replaced. All right, so cylinder's done, piston's done. When we come back, it's on to the crank, so hang out, we'll be right back. All right, on the crank, the first thing we're going to check is the bore ID of the little end of the crank rod. The bore is measured in the same way as the wrist pin bore and the piston, but the service limit for the little end is 13.05 millimeters. So at 12.97, this little end has plenty of life left in it. Now on to the big end. The range for this value is between 0.1 and 0.2 millimeters. Now out of spec on this is 0.4 millimeters, so if this feeler won't slide into the gap, this rod is good to go. Alright, so all done with the bottom end, now we're going on to the top end. The first thing we're going to work on is the cylinder head, and we're going to check that for warpage. The service limit on this measurement is 0.5 millimeters. This is a little bit hard to show, but using a machine flat surface, in this case I'm using the base of a start combination square, using a 0.5 millimeter feeler gauge, check for possible gaps by attempting to pass the feeler between the indexing surface of the square and the base of the head. Once you've checked the warpage, a simple way to check to see if your valves are sealing is to take something like this WD-40 and spray some into the port. Then basically just look to see if any of it leaks. All right, so if the valves don't leak, it's time to go on to the camshaft. Now, on a camshaft, you want to inspect this. First, the bearing, make sure it spins freely. And also, you want to be sure that there's no burn marks or any kind of unusual wear on the lobes of the camshaft itself, that's, that's a real common wear spot. Now if those all look good, the next thing to do is check for lobe wear. 
When you check the lobe height, you have to rotate the cam back and forth a few degrees to find the absolute high point. Now, each lobe has a slightly different service limit. This one, the intake, has a limit of 28.88 millimeters, and this one comes in at 29.05, so it's fine. The exhaust service limit, very close, but it is 28.9 millimeters, and this one comes in at 29.01, so also well within spec. All right, so next is the rocker arm assembly, starting with the rocker arm pin. And this one you measure in the exact same way as you measured the wrist pin on the piston earlier, taking several measurements along the axis of the pin. The out of service limit for this shaft is 9.95 millimeters, and this one is coming in repeatedly at 9.94, so this one is trash. Next is the bore of the rocker arm. It has a service limit of 10.05 millimeters. To get a good reading, rotate the rocker bore with the caliper end inserted. Now this one comes in at 9.97, so it's still good. On the rocker arm assemblies, just make sure to repeat this procedure for both sides. All right, so that is all for that. Next, we're gonna go on to something kind of fun, the transmission, starting with the gears. Look towards the center line of the gear teeth. Worn out gears usually have a shiny sort of polished looking center line. Look for any chips also on any of the teeth. Look for any wear marks on these engagement pins called dogs. Worn dogs will look kind of like sanded on their face and the gears into which they engage will kind of have a worn or glazed look like you might see on a brake rotor. Check that the gears spin freely without any run out or wobble and repeat these same checks on the opposing shaft. One measurement I forgot to show you is the groove height. This is where the shift forks engage in the uh, transmission cogs. The limit for this one is 4.3 millimeters and is represented here by the letter A. All right, so that is all for that. The next thing we're gonna look at is the shift forks. Now shift forks are something that is commonly worn out and commonly bent. So check those shift forks first for deflection. The two fork ears are different sizes, but the service limits are the same. So the ears have a service limit of 3.8 millimeters, and the pin service limit is 4.8 millimeters. Both of these come in with identical values of 3.91 for the ears and 4.91 for the pin, so both of these forks are good to go. Oddly, the shift fork pins do not have a specification, but they are supported on both ends, on both sides of the crankcase has, but not a bad idea just to look at those and make sure they don't look worn out with the same kind of burnish marks that you might see on something like, say, the piston wrist pin. All right, so final check, and this one is easy, the shift drum. Start by giving it a visual inspection, looking for any gouges. The maximum width of the groove should not exceed the service limit of 5.3 millimeters. Check the groove in several locations along the groove. This one's in good shape and has plenty of life left in it. All right, and with that, we are done. Pre-assembly inspection has been accomplished. Congratulations to you. I know it's not that exciting, but hey, you did it. All right, so let me, if I may, just offer a couple of tips. One is, whenever you're doing work like this, just use your common sense. Inspect the bearings, make sure that they're all spinning freely, check the timing chain, make sure there's no kinks or anything in it. Check everything, take your time. It's well worth it, believe me. If you put a motor together and you find out later the transmission won't shift and the reason was because the shift fork was bent or something like that, you wasted a lot of time. It's really, really frustrating. And if I could say just one other thing, and that is like doing this kind of work where you really take the time to measure these things out, check everything out, it's kind of like a, a, a sign of professionalism. You know, it's like a mechanical maturity. And this is the type of thing that'll send you on the road to truly becoming the master of your garage.